Hello. Hi, Perseus. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Farah? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is amazing. I can't believe you're here. You're like a rock star. <laughs> <right there. laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, no, bad. I'm so, <laughs> so pleased that you're able to join. I'm looking forward uh, uh, to hearing everything about it. Uh, so uh, with the... Um, so the setup, just um, when people are, when you're answering questions, is it more so geared towards uh, everything? Hi, Patrick. Hi, how are you doing? Hey, it's Hi, good. Patrick. Hi, how are you? Sorry, go on, Farah. No, so is it geared towards more so speaking broadly, or more so towards your own experiences, or you know, what's the what's the format of the um, the expectations and the formats of the answers? I think it just really speaks to your experiences because a lot of the people who are coming, they're really excited about you guys. I mean, can't believe Pat Patrick is here. So people are just really looking to hear more about this right journey, about Okra, to really understand what okay. you guys do differently and is there any playbook that you can just give. So I'll be asking some very lightweight questions, but the idea okay. is to not intimidate anybody at all. Okay. Great. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, we just expect So let me just share the link because uh, hoping is a bit special sometimes. For our congratulations on your success. Oh, thank you, thank you. Nice to meet you, Patrick. Yeah, likewise. And congratulations for all your success, generally. Oh, well, it's, it's, it still feels like a long way to go, as I'm sure it does for you. No, yeah, it's a, um, it's a very, especially when you're solving a really hard problem, you start thinking, okay, this is a lot. <laughs> and I, I bit off, let's see if I can chew it. Yeah, yeah, no, I think the, the naivete uh, that you feel at the beginning of like, ah, oh, it can't be that hard is kind of very important because you'd probably never try it, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you actually knew. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Hi. Actually, you have to Hi, Odin, how are you? Fine, thank you. Hi, Odin, how are you? Mm -hmm. Hi, 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 Odin, Hey, it's great to meet you. you. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, go on. Sorry, I didn't hear you. No, just saying, how are you this evening? Oh, very good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, good, thanks. Very excited to have you. <laughs> thank you. Nice to be here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we're just expecting two more people. Great. Uh, okay. And then again. So you guys can just chat uh, while I just configure hoping uh, behind. Take your time. Uh, where, sure. where are you all joining from? I'm in Lagos. Yeah, me too. How about you? Uh, I am uh, um, a few hours north of San Francisco. Uh, so um, uh, with the uh, with the beginning of COVID, um, uh, actually was uh, was on vacation near San Francisco and uh, and ended up staying in place for uh, the subsequent couple of months. <laughs> for indefinite. I always exactly. wonder about the people that were traveling halfway and got in like an airport and now you know we're living in turkey for like three right, months right, and right. Stuff. yeah no we, we were actually um my partner and i were supposed to be in uh, in europe um uh the, the week that uh the the u.s travel ban was was put in place so i think in, in some oh, wow. some alternate universe we're probably stuck there <laughs> okay, yeah exactly in some multi how are you yeah. Yeah, hi, I'm good, good. Hi, Shola. Hi, Shola. How are you? How are you guys? Very yeah, good. Mm -hmm. We're just expecting Eric to start. If he's not here uh, around a minute past, then we can begin. So allow people to join the other session as well. Okay. Shola, it looks like you've been busy. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Everyone has been busy. Hey, uh -huh. that uh, cool. The what? Paste that. Yeah, that looks really cool. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, merch as well. Paste that commerce. Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear you? I don't think he can hear us, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you guys know each other? No, we can't so, hear you. Hear us. <laughs> do you know uh, Shola at all? Have you guys met before? Oh yeah, I so, know Shola. Uh, I met Shola once before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Shola and I first met, I think, in, I don't know, I, don't know if you're us, but, uh, I think we first met in 2016, 2017. Wow. You guys are OG friends now. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Okay, so I think, Shola, uh, do you want to try and reconnect again? Maybe just disconnect. Yeah. Or you can click the, okay, he's gone. All right. <laughs> just give it a minute to join. Sorry, this this creates uh, some some suspense for for you know. Uh, to, Is it back? You know, what question they're going to get? Oh yeah, I can hear uh, you, Vincent. Uh, yeah. 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 You can hear and you hear us. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Okay, yeah. so we're all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right, perfect. This has been an amazing start. Thank you so much, everybody, for making on time. To give you a bit of background, when we started this conference, the whole idea was to inspire uh, people in Africa to create new economic models and platforms. So when we were thinking like, who can we invite? Uh, and you guys were just obviously top of the list. So we're really excited that you're here uh, to be able to get confirmations inside two weeks. That's amazing. So thank you so much. Uh, so maybe we can do a quick, a quick round of intros because I know you guys, but everybody else who's watching uh, might not know anything about you guys, uh, which is highly unlikely. So you can just quickly introduce yourselves. We can start with Farah. Hi, uh, everyone. I'm Farah. I am the a co-founder and the CEO and CTO of a company called Okra. Essentially, we are a financial services and data aggregation company. Infrastructure to allow end users, so whether that's individuals or corporates, connect their bank accounts directly to third-party applications. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Shola? Um, yeah, so hi everyone. My name is Shola Akinade. I'm the co founder and CEO of Payback, a uh, web payments company. Um, we help merchants and payments from their customers, um, like Stripe for Africa. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Odin. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Odun. I am co founder and CEO of PiggyVest. And PiggyVest is essentially an automated savings and micro-investment platform in Lagos, Nigeria. Thank you. And Patrick? Great. Uh, I'm Patrick Collison. I'm one of the founders of Stripe. Uh, I, uh, I grew up in Ireland, uh, but I now uh, live in the US. And uh, Stripe is sort of like Paystack for some other parts of the world. <laughs> <laughs> All right, perfect. Thanks for that. Yeah. So the focus of this session is how do we develop uh, the internet economy? And I guess we can start with you, Patrick. When you started Stripe, what was it that made you so bullish on the internet? Uh, what trends were you noticing in that time? And how have you seen the growth uh, of the internet uh, in the US versus in Europe? And how might that affect Af Africa? Um, well, the reason we started Stripe was just because uh, we realized that as developers, uh, it was um, lots of things were getting easier. It was getting easier to launch a website. It was getting easier to create a blog. It was getting easier to, I don't know, create an email account, whatever. Lots of things were getting better. Um, but the process of moving money around was still stuck uh, in the world of sort of legacy banks. And they didn't really understand internet-based internet business models. And, you know, if you weren't kind of reputable in their eyes and weren't willing to jump through all the hoops, uh, then uh, it was really pretty difficult to get started. Uh, and we, re we really knew nothing about the landscape uh, in the beginning. Uh, we, um, uh, you know, we, we wrote emails to people at, you know, different banks and so on, uh, mm -hmm. uh, asking, hey, can you help us start a payments company? And, you know, of course, most of the time they didn't reply. Uh, so we, we, were, we were very naive in the beginning. Uh, but hey, that, that's kind of where it came from. And then the, the thing that I think people often overlook, and, and just honestly part of the reason that, um, you know, we're so proud to be uh, investors in, in Paystack and just kind of interested in Africa more broadly, uh, mm -hmm. is... Um, you know, people when they're doing analyses of business opportunities, they tend to be kind of very focused on what currently exists. Uh, you know, that, that's what, what you can get numbers on. That's what you can properly quantify. It sounds rigorous uh, and robust. Uh, but, you know, in sort of management consultant style thinking, I think it's harder to reason about what could be happening if it was easier uh, or what might be the case uh, in 10 years or in 20 years and so on. And so with Stripe, we're interested in how do we help more companies get started? And we don't know exactly how many will get started, but we think by making it easier, it could be many more. Okay, perfect. You mentioned that you're an investor in uh, Paystock. Can you uh, talk about what exactly that you saw in Paystock and then we can hand over to Shola. 
Well, I don't want to embarrass Shola too much, but we thought uh, that the founding team was incredible. We thought that the, the team in general, uh, beyond the founders, uh, also seemed really strong. We were very impressed by their uh, product uh, rigor and thoughtfulness. We learned from things that uh, that, that, that Paystack builds. Uh, I mean, they just launched uh, Paystack Commerce this week. Uh, and there's a bunch, I mean, uh, Shola does himself a disservice by saying it's Stripe for Africa. They're doing things that we haven't done. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, hopefully, or we hoped that, I guess, we will kind of help a bit with some things that we had to, you know, do or figure out kind of in advance of them. But I think the learning, uh, uh, you know, real, our, our desire was for the learning to be kind of bidirectional. And that's what's, uh, what's turned out to be the case. Okay. As Darren says in the comments, Stripe is the paystack of the United States of America. There you go. <laughs> Shola, uh, the man of the moment at the minute, you've just released uh, Paste of Commerce. What is Paste of Commerce and how does it help uh, merchants? Yeah, cool. So, um, Paste of Commerce is our toolkit for creators of the continent to help people just get on the internet and do on the internet. Um, so, just to piggyback on the question you asked, Patrick. Um, mm -hmm. about, like, Events and all that. Um, when we started Paystack, um, what I wanted to do personally, and I think what a lot of early people at Paystack wanted to do, was to figure out how to accelerate digital payments in the continent. You know, we thought there was a lot of work we could do um, to just make payments work. Like Africa is the most penetrated payments market in the world, and that is extremely frustrating. If you're yeah. not African, I am Nigeria, like it is, it is annoying, you know. So, like, a lot of what first just wanted to make this work. Um, I think we made good progress when we launched Paystack. Nigeria was doing about thirty-five million dollars online in digital payments. Today, Paystack is doing about four times more than what Nigeria was doing. So, I think we've made progress. But there's still a lot of work to be done, and one of the parts that we haven't made. And I'll shout out to Figuvest, Odo is here, Odo is involved, right? Early customers, you know. Companies like Figuvest, <laughs> and the first version of Paystack, or the early Paystack, a lot of, we, we were lucky to have people like Figuvest. And we've seen Figuvest scale significantly and build like a very strong financial services brand in the country. But this year, we noticed that we were not doing enough for commerce, you know. Everybody likes to say that, yo, commerce is happening on the in, um, on Instagram and all that. But personally for me, I think the problem with business owners in Africa is that we don't have access to the best tools, you know. So if if you're selling um, maybe a shirt on, on, on Instagram, does Instagram give you the ability to like set your variants, like a blue shirt, like a white shirt, you know, like if you don't have access to these tools, you won't be able to scale your business, you know? So, mm -hmm. And to work at Paystack, we ask ourselves a question, what can we do? How can we help creators in the continent get their products to anyone, anywhere, you know? And it was a long journey of talking to people, figuring out how we could help. Um, and we started with Paystack Commerce. It's still very early, we put our roadmap Publicly, so yeah, you can follow that journey. But I guess I hope I've answered the question. <laughs> uh, I was just going to connect because you said uh, Piggy is one of your early customers. Yes, very early. I have, I have a secret. I let me share. I've never shared <laughs> But one of the Piggy, I launched the launch was like in January 2016. And mm -hmm. uh, the Piggyverse founders reached out to me and said, you know what, wow, we just demo Paystack. So we, we were trying to use Paystack for the other company. And like, oh, we just saw Paystack, we like it. We think we can like build something very interesting on it such that, you know, people can save, we can take their money every day. I might have the worst idea I've heard in my life. But, <laughs> but, don't worry, don't worry, you are not alone. Every, everyone I, so I, I did not know how to come use it, you know. I the probably was the largest customer now. So like yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I forgive you. Forgive you. Mm. Uh, before we come to you, Odin, uh, we can just let Eric introduce himself. Buddy, uh, I'm uh, I'm Eric Tornberg. I'm a co-founder of Village Global, which is a uh, driven seed firm. 
um, and also co-founder of OnDeck, which is something like a Y Combinator for people before they started their company. So maybe they're at, uh, they might start a company in the next six months and they're looking for co-founders, people to brainstorm uh, ideas with. And our mission is to remove the bottlenecks that people have from, uh, from starting companies. And so we want to see uh, you know, many more founders and, uh, and help reduce those bottlenecks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, perfect. Thank you for that. So Farah, uh, Patrick and uh, Sherla have spoken about their businesses and you've been in the news quite a lot about building this super connector. How do you see Okra playing a role in this new world we're going into? What exactly are you guys building? Sure. Um, I think that Patrick says something when you talked about building for things in the future, building for things that don't exist yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the major hurdles when you're building an infrastructure business and when you're uh, interconnectivity and allow you know people easy access to uh, build services is that your customers don't exist yet. So you're essentially uh, building you know uh, technology right now to help people solve problems right now. But the core you know the core people the core biz- the core idea behind infrastructure is to allow you to build things at scale, allow you to build different things for the future, allow you to innovate, allow you to build newer technology. So I mm-hmm. think that you know one of the, uh, you know that's what we're trying to one of the problems we're trying to solve. We're trying to be able to build. Um, a, you know, a unified banking API to allow access to the people here. I mean, we're, we start with Nigeria, which is the largest market in Africa, but then, you know, how do we scale that across Africa? How do we give access to, you know, applications, even piggyback, you know, how does best start, you know, using information of their customers to better, you know, ask, entertain, um, you know, different, um, you know, investment opportunities, different saving opportunities, so on and so forth. So we're trying to build on an infrastructure to allow uh, the future of the, you know, the internet economy. So what does that look like? What new services can you do? How can you scale your businesses? Data? How can you provide value added services? How can you go beyond even and, and start focusing? And you're not focusing on, you know, how do I connect a bank account? which is, you know, we're, we're taking that hassle away from you and doing it in such a way we're trying to make it plug and play, try to make it easy to access and try to make everybody be able to use it, whether or not, you know, and that's when it comes to, you know, access as we grow with internet access, data penetration and the access and the ability to gain uh, this da- data points, then how do you get somebody on USSD thinking, uh, how do you get them to use the same services? How do you get them all on PD Vest? You know, how do you get everybody using what the future is of, you know, of internet? Yeah, perfect. Thank you for that. Talking about pages, I think the one thing that you guys have going common is that all of your customers, uh, from Stripe uh, to Paystar, even to Okra and Pigulas, uh, Village Global as well, like everybody loves the way that you develop your products, the way that you talk about your businesses, and that's especially true for Pigulas. At your core, how do you see your role in helping uh, the market that you're operating as Pigulas? Um... Our role, uh, okay, so I think that at the end of the day, uh, we would eventually like to play the role of a bridge. So um, when we started in 2016, like Shola mentioned, it was a relative, FinTech was like relatively new. It wasn't like a thing that was common. And when we launched, we were just lucky to um, have Paystack have launched like a couple weeks before we started the idea for Piggy Vest. Mm-hmm. And um, since then, we've learned about the market in so many unique and different ways and opened up so many different frontiers that the role that we're playing for the market now is that of connector. So Piggy Vest launched as a savings platform. And over the past four years, we've added micro investment, dollar savings. But more importantly is the recognition of the fact that we cannot provide all financial services right? Um, that, that would be impossible. But we've grown so much that we have a sizable um, chunk of the market. And that means that we can help that size, that size of the market that we've cornered access financial services. So that's like the positioning that we're after now in the market is helping to move the market towards a point where young people have access to financial services, Mm-hmm. But we would like them to do it through the platform that we've built. So essentially, we would be the bridge and the connector between the financial services market, the traditional institutions, the legacy institutions, and the new millennials, the new Gen Zs who interact with the world via their smartphones and in very small bits. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Eric, what would you like to talk about? Beyond Deck or Village Global? 
Probably uh, on deck because I'm I'm interested to learn more and, and uh, about bottlenecks that face uh, African entrepreneurs from starting companies. Some some that we've identified that are, are obviously similar, but uh, are are co-founders. So we, we help with co-founder matching, uh, startup ideas, um, just money and stipends. So we have a ISA program called Runway where we pay people to to leave their company and and start a company. Uh, health okay. insurance where we're, we're focusing on, on that one right now and then uh, and then immigration but i'm curious if there are any others that that come to mind or mm. so you said it's a bit like mini yc you allow people to come and relocate and live with you guys so that you can teach them how to build internet businesses well uh, 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 yes in that um it's a it's a community and it's a network and people sell to each other and people hire each other uh, we, we don't relocate so uh, before uh, covid we were all in san francisco and it was it was all in person and then uh, after COVID, we went 100% digital and now are accepting people all over the world. And it's, uh, it's 100% digital uh, community. And we have mm-hmm. lots of different you know, uh, events and activities. And it's sort of a big buffet where people can you know, pick and choose w- what they want. Because some people you know, are, at air- are still at their company full time. Uh, some people are full time exploring. Some people have just started their company looking for a co-founder. And so people are in different stages. Mm-hmm. And are you seeing a lot of applications from Africa? Like, is there anything that you're trying to particularly do to be able to target uh, early stage um, founders? Yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of Nigerian um, uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, and we have uh, Yele from, from Micro um, mm-hmm. and some people here, here in the chat, evidently. And um, we're, we're looking to do more. I, I think we're actually, one challenge for, for Yele, who just started this, this last cohort, is that the time zone uh, differences. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, he's waking up in the middle of the night to, to come to some of our sessions. So we're going to yes. do a separate dedicated set, uh, you know, session for, for this, t- this time zone. And so we're looking mm-hmm. to have uh, more entrepreneurs so we can do that. Okay. Cool. Uh, I guess this is a question for you guys, uh, talking about COVID, we don't want to dwell too much on that. How has been the impact, uh, whether positive or negative on all of your businesses? And is there anything that you guys have done? That's been uh, more interesting that you do think we may be going to do a few months ago before the event. I guess I can answer that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, COVID, uh, two like a two um, a two prong you know uh, stick. So essentially, on one side we had the the um, a lot of companies coming an onslaught of more companies. So companies that usually said, maybe we'll take a look at this next year. Uh, We'll look at this next year, forced to look at organizational risk. They're forced to look at how do we build, you know, technology in a place, in a, in a time where people can't come physically and fill out a form people, you know, how do we onboard? How do we do KYC? How do we, you know, how do we still run our business? um, But now uh, people are at home. So because of that, we had a lot of companies rushing to use us, trying to look at our data, how they can use it in different ways, and you know how can they use this in their businesses. Uh, so within our companies, though, then we ha- within our company, we had to look at scale. How do we now scale that? How do we scale our team to support you know what's coming and what's going on? So, but still keeping to under- still having people come on board that really know, understand your vision, understand what it is you're trying to do, and tied and keyed in, and then don't have a, you know a large amount of ramp up time because if you look at that uh, and you have to completely ramp up, then you're not really solving the problem that you're trying to, you know, you're, that you have at hand. So I think that that's really what it's all. And, you know, everybody's forced to go remote um, you know, by, by, you know, by, by, by factor of that, if you were already working remote, if you already set up processes and stuff that work for that, which, you know, we're already on Jira, we're already using kind of tools and we're kind of already set up for that. Uh, how do you keep yourself from being more distributed than you are, you know, remote? How do you, you know, still under, how do you still not become transactional? Uh, how do you keep, you know, the water cooler conversation going on? Uh, and those are the kind of areas that we kind of start like and and try to build you know constant communication loops around and how to keep those communication loops going whether it's slack and still having that feeling of you know one-to-ones with your coworkers and the ability to know that you know i'm still working on a team all happening because uh most of our you know most of our uh, our team scaling has been through COVID. so majority of the people that we've had you know join okra have done so remotely and then how do you still keep on that same you know that team team spirit uh, has been you know something mm-hmm. that that. And then what comes next? What's the new normal? And you know, how does your you know, how do you- oh, I'm curious. 
go back, or, or, or any of you, do you plan to go back to a sort of a n- normal office setup, or do you, you know, do you think things will look? No, that's a, yeah, that's a really, that's a really good question. Like we've gone back and forth so many times. There's days that you wake up and say, "We're remote. We're never going back to an office. What do you need an office for?" And the next day, it's like, "I really miss everybody. Oh my gosh, like I can't just be yeah. in the house." So I think we're trying to kind of feel like I think that we will have a very uh, remote for, forward culture. So now we know that we can get work we can get it done at the same, you know, yeah. to the same caliber, to the same standard, um, and sometimes even more work done. So, you know, not feeling like we have to go to the office, and, but then also knowing that, hey, let's still have face-to-face time. Mm-hmm. Sure, like, uh, when you're speaking with merchants, what are some of their top concerns, especially in this environment? Yeah, um, I guess for us, it's like, do I have access to developers? Like, you know, so I think what we've seen is that, so the bad part is that some industries were affected, like travel. But the good part is that a lot of people are now moving online, you know, commerce is moving online and all that. Uh, we're seeing like times more sign-ups, weekly sign-ups than before. Um, but a lot of people are also like struggling to just like be fully tuned, you know, like, People are asking for developers, people are asking for more things, you know. So and that's why in the last three months we've really accelerated a lot of our projects. So if you think yesterday we announced craft CMS, the day before we announced weeks, you know, just because like people are struggling to find a developer to help them just like plug in mm-hmm. stuff, you know. So and that's we also we did we had to like um we connected people to agencies. We had seven agencies, we're connecting them to people. So I think it's, it's really just like finding developers to help them go online. We can do as much as we can on the tooling side, but I think depending on their use cases, they still need developers. Mm-hmm. And for you, interesting is uh, uh, Shola and I have sort of compared uh, some of the numbers, sort of Stripe and Paystack. Um, and uh, let's, I mean, I, I think for both Stripe and Paystack, we're seeing increases uh, in signups as, you know, businesses obviously uh, seek to uh, kind of adapt to the COVID economy and can't do as much uh, in person. Part of what's been interesting for me is that the relative increase in the signup rate has been greater for Paystack than for Stripe. Um, and, you know, obviously there's a lot of, you know, potential causes there, but, but, but what I wonder about is, is it the case that for whatever reasons in the U.S. and Europe and so on, businesses aren't able to adapt as quickly uh, as the, the businesses that uh, Paystack is, is, is serving? And so the kind of dynamism uh, that, uh, that Paystack seems to be seeing is certainly quite striking to me. Okay. Uh, sorry, oh, it looks like you want to say something. I am just going to say that, like, as one of the businesses that Paystack is serving, and probably speaking for most of the businesses in Nigeria, we've um, worked in, like, really awful conditions that I think that for the most part, for many businesses, adjusting to operating um, half via the internet, half onshore, is not new to us. Right. And um, I mean, there were there were a lot of casualties as a result of um, the, the crisis. But for the most part, we we have uh, there's yeah, that, um, Darren is making a really good point about how there being a lot more room for digital penetration in Nigeria. And we've all gotten to try like very many new methods and very many new things during this process. But I think that a lot of the, uh, the grit that comes from working in an economically austere environment has really translated to this period that is giving, like, you know, business is not great for many people, but for the most part, like, I think that a lot of the businesses will survive because this isn't particularly worse than it, like, it's not as bad as it could be. And I'm speaking as a Nigerian, as a person who's doing business in Nigeria. So, um, yeah. And maybe, maybe some businesses won't survive and that's very unfortunate, but so far, uh, the ecosystem has kind of come together to see how we can make it work for businesses here. And, and I'm speaking for Piggy Vest now as well. Um, people are withdrawing more. You know, people are like having a lot more financial like responsibilities to fulfill. But mm-hmm. people are also saving more because uh, anecdotally, Nigerians always like to look to the future. And no one wants to be caught like unawares when Corona suddenly decides to go away. Yeah, I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, to make, yeah, sure. To make, to make a broader point a little bit, we used to say before COVID that it was 
less important to be located in Silicon Valley to, to start a company, but more important to be connected to, to Silicon Valley capital or and talent. But mm. in a post-COVID world, I, I think that sort of misses the point, which is I, I live on the internet now. Uh, I live on the internet. And if you think what I like about that is it's, it's the great equalizer. You know, if, if you think of on deck as trying to unbundle the university, uh, you know, we've, uh, education has been democratized broadly. Uh, you know, now our network is starting to be a more democratized. We were just serving San Francisco. Now, now we're serving globally. And I, I think the last thing to uh, democratize that I'm, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about, we're thinking about it internally is credentials. And mm-hmm. one thing I'm really excited about is, is peer-to-peer credentials. Uh, and now if, if I asked all the people on this call, who are the top five people you know, under 25 that they think are gonna do amazing things, I would value that more than a, than a Harvard degree. Um, and yet uh, I don't have that information. And so we would like to create a, uh, love to create a platform that-, that, that like you know, no, um, What'd you say? Like a human IPO platform. Well, you know, uh, human IPO is for is for investing, <laughs> and, and and maybe that can that can be a result of it. But even, even social capital, uh, like an angel list for for social capital, you know, pa- Patrick and Tyler Cowan had this great sort of post and writing about you know raising uh, others' aspirations, and and one way to do that is is you know telling them to, uh, they're capable of more or being a role model. Another way is uh, is, is telling the world that they're capable of more uh, and raising their. Their collective, uh, their collective aspirations, and Twitter serves this a, a, li- a little bit. Um, but I, I think there could be, you know, more platforms that, you know, once we figure out peer-to-peer credential, um, Harvard and you know, university system, which you know favors U.S. Uh, students, obviously, will have less and less sort of, you know, uh, credentialing hegemony. And um, I'm really excited about d- democratizing that. I'm curious if anyone here has has any ideas uh, about that that challenge. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the internet is democratizing uh, the experiences of everybody. One thing that we've struggled with uh, as Zazu is opening up a, a, an account in the, in the U.S. because I've never been to the U.S. Well, I've been once, uh, but I didn't like it so much. So anyway, that's a story for a different day. <laughs> but a very good question here. Uh, he says, uh, I would love to know when uh, Stripe and Paystack will collaborate on smoother international payments for verified businesses from Nigeria. There's still a lot of opportunity to take African businesses global, but it's too, too hard. And I think that's a really good point because if this session is supposed to be looking at building the internet economy, then it figures that we should enable uh, internet businesses wherever they are to be able to get paid quickly. So I guess this is a chance for you two guys to tell us what you're working on behind the scenes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I actually looked at some numbers um, uh, b- before this, and um, like already, it's the case that thousands of like even though Stripe does not yet uh, uh, serve African businesses directly. Uh, I mean, obviously, I hope we can in the future, but we, we don't today. Even though that's not formally the case, um, there are thousands of entrepreneurs actually running businesses on Stripe from Africa already today. Um, now, that's harder than it could be because they have to incorporate an entity somewhere else, right, in one of the kind of companies we do support. But it's actually uh, already the case that, uh, that, that thousands of people are doing so. It's also the case that um, uh, uh, with Atlas, uh, uh, people I, ch- I checked now in 32 countries across Africa have actually incorporated a U.S. business uh, w- without actually having to, you know, go to the U.S. Right, uh, uh, and uh, and so they have, you know, a Delaware corporation. They get a U.S. bank account uh, and everything mm-hmm. else. So th- those are kind of two ways in which we're we're, we're doing it at the moment. Uh, but certainly, you know, we're we're we're, we're and I'll, I'll let sort of Shola speak to this. You know, we're very interested, uh, you know, over the long term in figuring out ways that you know we can work with Paystack uh, to figure out uh, how can we broaden and deepen our support for Africa because you know it's it's clearly as we look, you know, twenty years out, going to be such a, a uh, you know, a significant fraction of the future of the world. Absolutely. Shola, you look like a deep in thought. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I, I think Patrick is correct. And the question is also very correct. Um, I think there's still so many opportunities to take African businesses global. Um, I think it is still, like, if you think about it, it's easier for me to buy something from someone in the U.S. now than it is for someone in the U.S., to buy something from someone in Lagos or someone in Osaka. Um, and that advantage or that disadvantage is something we have to like 
you know, like equalize, you know. Um, some of the tactical things we're doing, um, one of the first things we've done, and we're probably going to talk about it soon, um, is just to roll out um, address verification. Um, because I think, again, just authentication is a big problem. You know, when you have a US issued card and you use it on a Nigerian merchant, like the Israel is screaming, the card network is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, so like some of the things we're doing is like just making it easier to reduce um, the risk, you know. And so we've we, we, we rolled out address verification now. We've seen progress there. Um, Luckily, like working with the Stripe Financial Partnerships team also to see what we can do on the card network layer um, to just see how to make things work better. You know, like, Bank of America is good, is just going to be worried when they see an authorization from Lagos, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the one that I'm to try, you know. So, like, and so sometimes just finding and working with people like Visa and Stripe um, has been helpful and we'll continue to do that work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think actually shows me a very important point. That obviously, there's um, a sort of two dimensions to this. There's sort of how can uh, Stripe or how can how can kind of we collectively as an industry sort of better serve businesses in Africa. But obviously, there's the flip side of it, which is uh, uh, how do we help you know, businesses around the world uh, properly serve uh, consumers uh, uh, or buyers uh, uh, across Africa? Um, and uh, you know. Uh, again, I think this is where sort of the management consulting thinking fails because when you look at the numbers today, they're not that large. Uh, and but, but of course, they're not that large because we've done such a poor job of like actually connecting them. And so we had this experience with China where we'd go to US businesses and be like, hey, you guys should support, you know, WeChat payments and Alipay and so on. Like, well, you know, we don't actually sell a lot in China. We're like, you don't sell a lot in China because you don't support it. Um, uh, and then, you know, we'd go and add support uh, and, you know, they'd see, man, actually, there's like a, a lot of folks here who want to buy it. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and so, you know, a kind of specific example is we um, uh, ideal is a payment method used in Holland, uh, and uh, we we recently kind of went and extended the support so that ideal can be used, you know, accepted by businesses in you know all sorts of places like Hong Kong or whatever, you know, places where most of the business have never even heard of ideal. And it turns out that once you sort of build the proper consumer support, sales from 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 that country or that region really tend to skyrocket. Uh, and so for you know very kind of logical reasons, and so I think there's a very important question of how do we make sure that for businesses around the world, even the businesses that don't know how, you know, what's the biggest or most popular online payment method in Ghana? How do we make sure that they're accepting it, even if they don't know all the details? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for that, all of you. There's a great question here from Harriet. What are your thoughts on digital tax and its implication on your businesses and the internet economy in general? For example, Kenya is currently tabling to impose 1.5% digital tax on the value of online digital transactions. Hmm. Obviously, we won't be happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I will just start. Wait. One of the things I personally don't have a lot of control over yet is how regulators like decide things and how they act. Um, as, as a founder of a finance company, one of the things that gets me nervous is <laughs> how regulators behave. Um, but one of the advice, you know, when I asked Stripe funny enough about like how, how how should you think about this? And what they said was that it is like knowing how to deal with compliance and regulation is a competitive advantage. Like it is a muscle you have to build. It is something you have to learn. It is, you know, like and, and it is something we're trying to do at pace back now. Um I guess my point is that. The regulators will have to do what they want to do, and we have to figure out like the best way to help our customers to handle it. To, to mm -hmm. react, you know, um, yeah, but that's, that's my short answer to that. Okay. Anybody else want to add anything to that before we move on? No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Farah, like one of the things that you've done really well uh, that maybe you can speak to is raise funding six months after your company was founded. I think when everybody raised that, that was quite impressive. Is it because you're building an awesome uh, infrastructure platform that's going to be useful in the next 20 years? Uh, what do you attest to that? Um, I think, yeah, I think that one thing is, um, you know, looking at building a a uh, company or a business or a service that is going to stand the test of time. So it's going to really be an enabler. Uh, I think that that's one of the things. And also, you know, just um, moving really, 
at Wooker, we really believe in speed and, and impact and um, execution and just really just making sure that your clients have actions. Uh, but they were just talking about, you know, making sure you're building things. Um, it was in one of the other sessions, but just building things and knowing how to break it down. I think building hard businesses in Africa. So like looking at the problem you're trying to solve and understand what is the problem you're trying to solve now. So, the, you know, the first problem we were trying to solve is just connecting your bank account. So how quickly can we do that? How can we get that to market? And then how can we start listening to the market? Because like I said, a lot of our customers don't really exist yet. We don't, you know, we, we really had to figure out what is the business that we're building? How are people going to use this? And then how do you now build a product um, for that over time? So I think that's the ability to just really understand what that problem is, what you're trying to solve, how big that problem can get, um, and how big you know, the solution also can be. And, um, and so for us, it was more so uh, based on our thesis where, you know, financial innovation cannot happen without the proper infrastructure. And for us, we looked at that as uh, this data, this interconnectivity, this, uh, and then just even uh, tying into what Shala was saying about uh, access, us having access is harder for somebody to buy something from us uh, here in Africa than it is for us to buy from um, in the U.S. So if we can open up this you know, this economy as well, our bank accounts, can we connect that into an Amazon? Can we connect that into, you know, whatever, and then also have those same goods and services uh, mm. along with, you know, this kind of KYC verification and so on and so forth in this market? You know, that would be good. So I think it really just ties into just understanding we're solving a real big problem and, um, and uh, you know, what, how, how that what that, what that impact is on the businesses that we're solving those problems for. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, there's a question here which I think relates to uh, what you're talking about about building for future businesses, and if most of the population growth is going to be happening in Africa and Asia, then we're going to see a lot of internet businesses being started here. But the question here from Ada says, how does the industry address the challenge of building an internet economy in Africa? where African residents are paying the highest rates in the world for internet access per GB, while having the lowest income, should the international tech industry have an obligation to uh, to bridge the digital divide considering the best of interest? I guess uh, what, what, what has happened recently is that Facebook have announced that they're going to be helping to develop uh, some of the internet infrastructure. Is that something that you guys think that should be happening across uh, the board from everybody who's got a vested interest? In I mean, I think I think it should be happening. I don't know that it should be happening from Facebook, uh, but I think it should be happening. And I don't think that it's particularly a bad thing for the international tech industry to step in to build the infrastructure despite the vested interest. Mm -hmm. I think it's a matter of like um, weighing will it be for the greater good and what does the future um, of it look um, the, if, if the government isn't going to build it and the private sector cannot do it alone then we actually do have to look to the international tech community to help right so who does it uh, and also I think that, that um, focusing on who um, is doing the building might be taking the focus away from the actual need that is on ground mm. you know if we're going to wait for uh, the right person to build it. How long do Nigerians keep paying the most expensive price for data? You know, how long is it that we'll be um, like frozen out of international transactions for being Nigerian or for there being a lack of infrastructure? And also the question would be, if not them, who are we waiting for? Who will do it, right? And who can do it right now? Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is we're going to see Okra, Paystack, uh, and Pigilus collaborating to do the internet infrastructure. Yeah, if I, if I have the money, I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, one counterintuitive way I've seen um, the infrastructure problem um, being solved is by some of these use cases that we're building. You know, so um, when I think like by by just giving people the reason to use the internet. Um, even if it's expensive, you still get more people, and because more people are using it, at some point it becomes cheaper. You know, so in the last four years, the number of businesses that have been built that have given people like more opportunities to use the internet. So, like, if I wanted to buy electricity before, I had to walk to a, a store. You know, if my electricity goes off tonight now, you know, without the internet, the only way I can get my electricity back. It's to buy it on the internet. And so when you compare the price, like it's cheaper, you know, um, when I see in there, you know, like it's, when you have like buy coins, like when you have more people just building things, um, like yeah. it just creates more people on the internet economy. So I agree that like it will be makers like us that would like create that 
that uh, mass just movement and more people coming on will just automatically create like cheaper prices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there's a question here. How do we avoid or mitigate against a WhatsApp event? <laughs> I, guess, I mean, just keep Zuckerberg out. <laughs> I guess if we're talking about building the internet economy, then it figures that most of the businesses uh, in Lagos or in Lusaka here, they are all uh, already trading on a combination of Instagram or WhatsApp, and they're already being paid uh, in cash or some other way. Should we be looking to develop our own platforms, or should we be look, should we should we be waiting for WhatsApp Pay uh, to arrive here, or should we be waiting for Shola to launch uh, ASAP Commerce everywhere? Why is Shola smiling? Shola, I'm waiting for you to respond. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I was laughing. That's exactly why I was laughing. <laughs> To go to party. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Eric. I think Eric was responding already. Yeah, go on, Eric. <laughs> can, can you re, uh, sort of re, re summarize the, the question? I'm sorry. Uh, the question is how do we avoid or mitigate, mitigate against a WhatsApp event? Well, I, uh, and, and I'd be curious to understand just for that question. You know, is WhatsApp event sort of some of the sort of misinformation that's been you know problematic in you know uh, various places in which in which WhatsApp adoption is really strong, or is it is that referring like specifically to the use of WhatsApp for payment? Because I guess those are quite different. Yeah. The way I read it, I think he was talking about uh, WhatsApp payment, but we'll let Paris respond to that. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm not knowledgeable enough on the on the situation, so I'll defer to, uh, to anyone else who is. Okay. Another question has come through from Olamide. What uh, is Tribe shying away from crypto? Um. Basically, well. <laughs> I think we're not shying away in the sense that we're the first major payments company to support us, to support Bitcoin. Uh, and then we also uh, helped support um, uh, Stellar when they got started back in, I think, 2015, maybe it was 2014. Uh, and so we, we've been involved with the crypto ecosystem. But the reason we're not investing more is because our roadmap is really determined by uh, what our users are asking us for. Uh, and our users are asking us for uh, you know, support for more countries, support for more payment methods, uh, easier to integrate, uh, um, you know, uh, verification uh, technologies for Stripe Connect, you know, these kinds of things. And we actually just don't get that many requests for Bitcoin support. Um, having said that, I think the cri crypto ecosystem is really interesting. I think it, it, it is obviously uh, sort of advan advancing and evolving uh, quite rapidly. I think there's the prospect that sort of, um, you know, the ecosystem kind of reaches a sort of critical mass uh, such that suddenly businesses realize, oh, hey, there's actually a huge opportunity here. But... Mm -hmm. I think the disruption that crypto causes is not going to be driven by payments companies. It's going to be driven by consumer behavior. Uh, and we are waiting to see in what way or when or how that consumer demand comes to arise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Makes sense. Uh, there's a question here that Eric has responded to. Can Africans get accepted into the OD fellowship? Yes, we have. Uh -huh. Do you want to speak anything uh, specific to OnDeck, specific for people who are watching here? Sure. So we have uh, uh, a few people who just joined us that, that I think are awesome uh, entrepreneurs in the region. Nadayar from, from Adela, um, Yele from, from MicroTraction, um, and the, uh, you know, the founder of this conference uh, itself. We, uh, and so I, um, we're, we're excited to, to have more, to, as I mentioned, to do its, its own sort of dedicated t time zone um, uh, sort of program. And um, Deo asked a, a couple minutes ago, for people who don't get in, um, what would you advise for them to get started on their, on their founder journey? And it sort of speaks back to what we were talking about earlier about, you know, if, if we live on the internet, what, what is the currency uh, of the internet? In, in Harvard, it's, it's a GPA or SAT or um, you know, the, the network that you build there. And on the internet, it's your, it's your sort of personal portfolio of projects that you've built it's your, you know, so it's your, it's your GitHub. It's your ideas that you you put on Twitter or Medium, and I, I would I would really invest on sort of building your currency uh, on the internet in a way that's that's very legible. And, and the more you build that currency, uh, the more other people will want to uh, interact with you, engage with you. That that's what we look at when we evaluate uh, applications. 
And so we would encourage people to apply to, to OnDeck. And if, if they can't get in today, continue building their, their skill set and their currency uh, on the internet such that uh, you know, they don't need us uh, or they can get in in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, my next question is for Shola, uh, because you've already, uh, you've been to South Africa and you guys have started to expand into there. How do you think about expansion into other African countries? What factors are you guys uh, considering when you make those decisions? Yeah, um, thanks for that. Today we're live in Nigeria and Ghana. Um, mm -hmm. and hopefully we'll be live in South Africa within the next one or two months. So we're making a lot of progress, actually. Um, I guess the way we think about it is, um, and you know, I mentioned something earlier uh, when I talked about um, the progress we made in Nigeria and how when we launched in Nigeria, Nigeria was doing $35 million and 100 but not in Forex. Um, personally for me, what, what the reason I do Facebook, you know, is the reason I'm doing Facebook, the reason I wake up every morning, you know, is because I feel like there's just so much that needs to be built on the payment infrastructure. Like there's so much that needs to be built in this continent that hasn't been built. Like I, I think payments, I think this is I think the digital infrastructure needs to get better, you know. And so when I think about expansion. I don't necessarily think about it as a flag painting exercise. You know, I mm -hmm. think about it as how much can we do to like accelerate the state of payments in a market. You know, and of course it won't happen in like three days. It won't happen in one month. You know, it would happen over a long period of time. You know, and we've been we've been working on Ghana for the last two years. You know, so I think so. Right now, our approach is very very aggressive, ambitious, and also very regional, you know, so we've already done Nigeria, we're doing South Africa, we're doing, actually we're already doing some things in Kenya, um, we're working on Ivory Coast. So I think in the next one year, you should be able to a very regional approach to face that, where we're in Nigeria, Ghana, Ivory Coast, so French speaking Africa, South Africa, and Kenya. And then we can now make more progress as we like, so payments in those hubs, yeah. So, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Odin. Oh no, I was just like um, agreeing with him um, mm -hmm. as to how expansion should be thought of. Like, uh, you think about it in terms of related characteristics of different regions rather than like individual countries. Mm -hmm. And what's been the main barrier for you guys at Figuvest uh, for growth? Uh, uh, for expansion, oh, we just wait for Paystack, you know. When they're there, we'll follow, we'll follow them like, and just join them when, wherever they are. So it makes it easier for us. So um, when we started here, um, a huge enabler was the fact that they had just built the recurring payment infrastructure that we needed for mm -hmm. the automated um, billings and savings that we have right now. So, um, and that's like a big uh, part of what the product does is recurring payments, daily, weekly, monthly, and all of that. Mm -hmm. So um, a country like, for instance, I think Ghana, uh, we've been watching the progress there. Uh, Ghana is very similar to Nigeria. And so once uh, Paystack says, oh yeah, we're fully like ready for you guys here, uh, there we go, you know? Mm -hmm. And then if we're like looking to Latin America, and then we'll be asking Shola, so where are you going next? So you going infrastructure is very, very important to like the savings business. Right, mm -hmm. we're going to go into a country, uh, for instance, Kenya already has Safaricom. If you don't yeah. have a conversation with Safaricom, you might be dead on arrival in Kenya. So the infrastructure, infrastructural partners is the biggest barrier for to expansion. And also, I suppose, there's starting to be solutions in that regard. Mm -hmm. What about for you, Farah? How do you think about building the internet economy and something that might stop you from achieving that vision? Um, I think that... Uh, well, Odin kind of hit the nail on the head when she talked about infrastructure being uh, a very important catalyst to expansion and, and moving, you know, your business in other places. So we are also looking at different markets and other markets, but also looking at in that market, um, who's already in that market and doing that business and needs, you know, needs to yeah. so that you can uh, 
can build infrastructure in places that can support that infrastructure. There's no point of going to build something if there are no businesses that need it there. Uh, so looking at that, I think that that's the one thing that, you know, um, that you, you look at carefully, like internet penetration, how many people are using data, what's the, you know, what is the banking, online banking penetration, USE penetration, so on and so forth in these, in these places as you move. So I think that that's one of the things that um, is, you know, we look, we're very excited about as well, because when you're solving those kind of problems, um, you, you can bring about not just uh, help for the companies there, that are doing it, but enable a new set and a new generation of entrepreneurs and, and small business owners and, um, you know, legacy companies that want to get online. And I think that that's, you know, that's, you know, that for me answers the question. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a question earlier uh, for all of you, like what kind of businesses are you, um, if you were to start a company now, what kind of sector would you be doing it after the event, which is COVID? Mm. <laughs> I guess you need to put a disclaimer to say this is not a proper startup advice. Don't start a company on my advice. But I'm quite interested in this. Hmm. You know, I'm going to just let other people answer. I still <laughs> care about finance. <laughs> yeah. It, it's hard. Like, for me, like, I, I personally don't know what else I would do. Yeah, <laughs> it's just hard. <laughs> you know, people tell me that I'm very lucky. You know, like, and I feel very lucky to just be in this industry where I can a, do my work, have fun, and still like be able to create immense value for myself and for like multiple people, our customers and all that. So, like, I would say I'm too passionate about parents to even think about any other thing. But uh, I don't know. <laughs> That is a non-answer, but okay. But I'd say education too, I think. I think it's like, um, if, if you can like figure out the bottlenecks, the Nigerian educational system is very, very ripe for disruption. But it's also mm. really, really steeped in like probably the worst um, processes and legacies and all of that. Right. They're like currently now we have in Nigeria, we have uh, the Association of Universities refusing to migrate to online learning even during COVID. So we mm. have like things like that that exist. I don't know if, if you have like the energy and we have uh, Sin Shagaya is already trying to do that with you lesson. Uh, so I don't know if you have like the energy and like the drive to really go for it. Education can be it, it will be really big for Nigerians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, energy. You see that even in the energy sector, um, with companies uh, trying to you know bring access to energy uh, across uh, Africa. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, Patrick. Um, uh, go for it. Go for it. Okay. Sure. Uh, so I um, two spaces I'm really excited about. The first one is is education. Um, as we were talking about, you know, I, I think it really doesn't make sense for people to go back. And this is not advice, but if I was a kid going back to Harvard or Stanford in the fall, and so people who are building alternatives to that, and we're excited about it. We we invested in a homeschooling company um, that we're really excited about. Um, and another area is uh, is consumer social. So again, you know, living on the internet, I, I'm, I'm physically here in Arizona in sort of the middle of nowhere and haven't seen people in, in quite some time, uh, but because of um, platforms, um, I, I, I feel I feel close to people. Um, I, the sort of cliche right now in Silicon Valley and elsewhere is is Clubhouse, um, but I think they've uh, they've shown that social audio is is really powerful um, way to still feel connected to, to people in a way that that text it doesn't, and in, and in a way that even video uh, it doesn't. And so I would sort of do two things. One is I would make a private version of Club, like just take all my Telegram groups, group chats, Signal groups, and be able to implement you know, social audio functionality um, on top of that. I, I think that's a big company waiting to be built. And then also I would think about, you know, just on, like we invested in a company that's like Discord for for um, sports fans to do sort of like game, uh, you know, play by play analyses, uh, you know, game recaps. If you're a sports fan or you know a sports fan, you love that they just, you know, you know that they just love talking, uh, you know, about, about sports with, with their peers. And so, and similarly with other sort of, you know, interest groups uh, that I would, you know, sort of unbundle, um, you know, Clubhouse meets Discord type of, type of thing. So that, that's what I'd be interested in. Okay, cool. Thank you. Patrick? Um, 
Well, I guess a quite specific one is, um, I don't do good business, but I sort of feel like our uh, desktop operating systems, uh, or I mean, really our laptop, but kind of our, our non-mobile operating systems uh, and our development environment um, are just not really making a lot of progress. Uh, and if you look at the best, I mean, in, in the 80s, uh, if you compare the 70s to the 80s, the rate of improvement in operating systems and development environment and so on was so high. And then for some reason, it kind of plateaued. And so I just think it's crazy that, you know, for example, time traveling debugging is not more common uh, or that you can sort of uh, dynamically instrument running processes more easily than you can. Uh, or, you know, just uh, it, it feels like the process of software development is really uh, sort of much more primitive than it should be. Uh, and you can kind of generalize that to, to the whole OS as well. I mean, I watched uh, Apple's keynote earlier this week, and obviously they're doing uh, uh, all sorts of cool stuff, but they feel very consumer focused uh, rather than focused on the creator, the maker, uh, the, the developer. Um, and uh, I just think there's a real opportunity there. So that's kind of one. Uh, the broader thing, and this is maybe just agreeing with, with everyone who brought up education, is I, I guess I would maybe generalize or broaden it or something a little bit where, uh, you know, if we think of just kind of human capital development in, in the broadest sense, uh, like how do we. Um, what are the most helpful, and again, this is probably not even a business, but like, what are the um, best kind of ideas or mindsets or role models or understandings or mental models or whatever for people to have a kind of about the world? Um, uh, I mean, I guess this is a question that you know, anyone who's a parent kind of has to think about. Uh, and, and I often wonder, are there are there high impact interventions that, that, that one could pursue in that vein that would just be sort of beneficial to a very significant number of people? I have no idea what the answers there are, but, uh, but I think it's a, it's an interesting set of questions. Patrick, do you have an idea what, what age group you're, 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 you're for? I've never played the problem, so I, I, I kind of I don't know what the best stages to intervene at are, um, or, or whether age even matters. Like you know, hypothetically, you can imagine that it, that it worked at any stage. Um, you know, intuitively, my guess is sort of ten to twenty-five, but that's just an intuition, and I've never studied it. Mm. There's a study uh, I'll send it to you after this, where there were some children who were adopted from Romania. And if they were adopted, like uh, when they were older than 36 months, there were severe attachment issues that they couldn't really function later on in life. So I think it speaks to that. Uh, I'll see if I can find it and send it to you. Uh, if you mind. Uh, that sounds very interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. This has been a very excellent panel. Uh, Do you have any questions for the audience? Uh, any more questions that we didn't get to? Something that you wanted to speak about? Patrick, mm -hmm. uh, oh, go for it. Uh, no, go ahead, Eric. We, we were just talking about uh, education. <laughs> I, I know you've looked into the is it the Bloom Sigma problem. Um, yeah, yeah. What, what have you learned, or what what are you still curious about, or what's what's still what's unsolved there? Well, um, Jose, Jose uh, Luis Ricon wrote a blog post about it, but uh, I guess I'll put the link to it in the chat, uh, which I think is probably the most comprehensive sort of uh, literature summary of, uh, of of that which has been published about it. I think that the, the TLDR is it's real, but probably not actually two sigma, which you know maybe is kind of what you'd expect. But but, but importantly, there probably is a, 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 a substantial uh, effect size there. Um, and the you know, questions for the audience, I actually have a lot, but I guess we don't have time in sort of three minutes. The thing I did want to make sure to say is, I mean, obviously, thanks to the panelists for joining, but um, but just uh, thanks, uh, honestly, to, to um, all the organizers uh, for putting this on in such a short notice. I know this was you know just an idea a couple of weeks ago, uh, and so I think it's uh, it's just it's it's cool you guys made it happen so quickly. Yeah, we're very excited. There's 169 people here who are watching. I think everybody wanted to see Wiza. Uh, <laughs> 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 we're trying to be on time, Wiza. Mm -hmm. We're trying our best. Yeah. It's a timely event. That's all. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next session will be happening uh, in two minutes. So we're going to. Yeah. Sorry, Wiza. No, I was just waiting for you. The next session is around cities as platforms for transformation with Heba El Hanafi, um, Ian Abueji, Mark Lada, Noyan Meyer, Mwia Musokotwani, and Jerry Serere. So mm -hmm. once we're done here, you can exit this session and join the next session for cities, just like 
leave this session in hopping and then join the other one. Uh, and then shout out to all of you guys who made the time to join this panel. It has been fantastic. Really, really love it. Excited to see you to come out of this. And I'm very glad that you could make the time. Great. Thank you. Thank so you, guys. For us. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you all. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye.